I wasn't aware that two processes were taking place simultaneously. At Luisa's house, you became increasingly conscious of the tasks confronting the class and of the local material and social conditions in which our group found itself. However, at the plant, Jan Sedlek absorbed not lessons drawn from the production process, but the lessons he drew from Luisa's mannerisms and unintentional comments. This happened in spite of the fact that Luisa never considered him a comrade. Sedlek's spontaneism, his instinctive rebellion, could have been channeled and controlled. It could have played a useful role in the workers' movement if the rest of the group, and particularly you, had remained conscious of the historical tasks. But gradually, you were swayed. Just what did this influence consist of, I asked him. Immaturity of consciousness, insufficient grasp of the needs of the, of the class struggle, lack of any coherent approach to organization and political activity, he answered. In Nacholo and Sedlak, we saw a total incomprehension of the three fundamental tasks of the revolutionary struggle of the proletariat. Class consciousness, proletarian theory, and organization. This was extremely grave. All the combined forces of capital do not represent as great a danger to the proletariat as the incoherent and uncontrolled forces within the proletariat itself. I devoted my life to the task of reflection and elaboration of the proletariat's historical project, the task of defining and isolating uncontrolled and dangerous forces within the proletariat's own ranks. What you don't understand is that Nacholo and his, and his likes appear to be the most militant workers during times when no organized struggle is taking place. But during times of struggle, they became obstacles and fetters to the proletariat. What was needed in the carton plant was a coherent structure to maintain and develop political clarity. Terrorist, petty bourgeois elements, fighting only to gratify their own personal desires, had no place in such a struggle. The entire aim of revolutionary theory can be reduced to this to define, isolate, and make possible the neutralization of such elements before they contaminate the entire class. This neutralization, Zebrin, how was it carried out? I asked him. By means of theory, by persuasion, by organizers like Louisa, by theorists like yourself? You've told me that in the earlier struggle you were a soldier in a so-called popular army. Tanks and rifles were the instruments with which you isolated and neutralized. The military organization was established within the framework of an incorrect perspective, as I've told you before, he said angrily. The class must make necessary use of violence, but this cannot be done by a minority separate from the general movement of the class. Terrorism, by individuals or separate groups like armies or police, is absolutely foreign to the methods of the class and constitutes a method which expresses the despair of the petty bourgeoisie. Damn it, I don't understand, I shouted. Do you actually conceive the, of the proletariat as a single body that turns all at once against its class enemy and deals a single blow, as if it didn't consist of individuals, of different groups? Just so, he said. And it is precisely this unity of purpose and unity of action that are sabotaged by individualists like Nacholo and Sedlek. Individualism is a disease. The entire tactics and strategy of the struggle reside in diagnosing this disease and isolating its carriers from the rest of the class not by military methods, but by the methods of science. Once carriers are isolated, their own followers tend to absorb the historical lesson and weld themselves to the iron fist which clears away the fetters that obstruct the historical development. I'm starting to understand, I said, feeling nauseated. The point is not for an army, a minority, to carry your theory into history. The point is for Nacholo's own comrades to carry your theory, and if possible, Nacholo himself. The point is to turn Nacholo's own comrades into partisans of a struggle he had repudiated from the marrow of his bones. So that's what you expected in the carton plant. Once Luisa and Sabina were no longer able to infect us with their individualistic virus, the rest of us were to turn to the correct tasks on our own, under no other pressure than that of the level of development of the productive forces. Yes, Yarostan, that's precisely the point, he said. The point is not the physical liquidation of spontaneity or combativeness, or instinctive rebellion. When this is done, the proletariat is left disarmed. This is when tanks and rifles substitute themselves for the proletarian fist, because it is the force behind the fist that is thus liquidated. The goal is to transform not only you, but even a Jan Sedlak or a Nacholo into coherent expressions of class power. And this cannot be accomplished by means of guns aimed at their heads. The proletariat's historical task is not that simple. It is the disease that has to be liquidated, not the proletariat. Surgery cannot be carried out by means of explosives, not even in historical periods when explosives are the instruments most re readily available to the surgeons. Theory has developed other methods, and these other methods cannot be considered utopian because proletarian theory is not an abstraction. It is an excrescence of the class. 
A Sedlak must be made capable of turning his energy toward the appropriation of the productive forces, when the historical opportunity for such an act presents itself. Instead of shouting like a reactionary Luddite, let's take the machinery into the street. A Nachalo must be made to distinguish his personal enemies from enemies of the class, and not left in a condition in which he greets the proletariat's own organization by shouting, Down with the Red Butchers! Yasna and Myrna were as startled as I was. The three of us jumped up. Yara and Zednik joined us. We formed a hostile circle around Titus. I asked him, Could you repeat that? What did you say? Nachalo shouted. He seemed disoriented and hesitated before answering. I've already told you I never met Nachalo. I believe it was Alberts who told me Nachalo had said something of that nature. Where was Nachalo when he said this? I asked. I believe he was at the front, Titus said hesitantly. But as I told you, I've tried to forget my involvement with that military organization, and I don't remember any of it, clearly. I shouted, It was the only time in your life when you were personally in a position to implement your theory, to apply the cure called for by your diagnosis. But that army was not an appropriate method, he protested. You're contradicting yourself, I exclaimed. You just said Nachalo shouted about red bushers in the face of the proletariat's own organization. This means you did regard that army as the proletariat's own organization, as the only historical available instrument. He protested, I couldn't have expressed myself. On the contrary, you expressed yourself very clearly, I told him. History's instrument was a firing squad. Titus stared at me with a bewildered expression and said nothing. I tried to remember the exact words of Sabina's account. In the real revolution, the people will turn against the red butchers first. Titus's face turned into a grimace of horror. His whole body started trembling. He looked at me wildly as if he were looking at a ghost, the ghost of Nachalo, whom he had never met. In a barely audible voice he said, That's impossible. Yasna, trying very hard to control her tears, walked to the front door and opened it slowly. Titus, get out of this house. Titus rose slowly. He didn't take his eyes off me. Every part of his body trembled as he walked out the door. Yasna closed the door behind him and fell into Myrna's arms abandoning all her self-control, trembling as Titus had on his way out. Zednik asked Myrna, Why did you make Yasna come down to face the gory end? You might have spared her. Myrna told him, I asked her how she'd feel now if she had married him when she first met him. Then she didn't want to be spared. Yasna wept convulsively. You tried to tell me, but I didn't want to believe you. I defended him to the very end. I know I would have stood by him when he had your Vesna taken away. Why are you so good to me, Myrna? It was he who was good, Yasna, and you had every reason in the world to defend him, Myrna told her. He was good the way Vesna was good, the way my mother was good. He did everything for the noblest motives, for his plastic Jesus, the proletariat. Who could have thought that such a good man was an assassin? He helped Yan and Yarastan find jobs after their release from prison. He also helped you, Yasna. He helped my father get a pension after he was fired from his job. He visited Yarastan in prison and helped me get a pass. Why are you repeating all that again? Yasna asked. None of us would have needed his help if he himself hadn't been responsible. I'm reminding you why you defended him, Myrna told her. Even I couldn't believe, believe it all until today, until he threw up all those gruesome details. Yasna asked, How in the world did you see what Yarastan and I could, never could have imagined? I had wanted to ask Myrna the same question, but, she, but just then Vera walked in from the dining room. She had been crying and looked as pale as Titus had looked when he'd left. The elegant, proud woman I had seen at the beginning of the celebration now looked old. The dark rings around her eyes made her face look like a skull with a wig and paint. Vera walked toward Yara, fell to her knees, embraced Yara's legs, and placed her head in Yara's bosom. She sobbed. I never meant any harm. You know that, don't you? Yara bent down to force Vera's hands away from her legs and walked toward me. She put her arms around me, pressed her head to my chest, and started to cry. Vera pathetically crawled on her knees toward Myrna, extended her hand, and reached for Myrna's hand. Myrna pulled her hand away, walked to Zednik's chair, and sat down on its arm, wrapping her arm around Zednik's shoulder. Vera turned to crawl toward Yara again. Vera, don't! Yasna screamed as she ran toward Vera and raised her to her feet. Yasna ran to the closet for Vera's purse and hat, I'll walk you to the taxi stand. You're overwrought, she told Vera, leading her out to the door, her arm around Vera's shoulder. Vera walked out mechanically, like a human being suddenly deprived of her understanding. When they had left, Zadnik commented, 
That woman is carrying all of Zabrin's guilt because Zabrin is too idiotic to realize what he's done. And Yasna is the only one of us with enough compassion to know that Krenna is carrying more than her share. She'd have done the same thing he did, Myrna insisted. Zenik objected, but the fact is, she didn't quite do the same thing. Yara was still sobbing. I used to think she was so wonderful, such a powerful, proud woman. I ran my hands through Yara's hair. She looked up. There were tears on her pretty, if not innocent, face. You like me again? she asked me. Yes, Yara. As much as you liked Irina? she asked. I blushed and looked away from her eyes. Her hands dropped from behind me. I put her hands back and forced myself to say, More, Yara. Infinitely more. Show me, she said. Her eyes were big, her lips partially open. I embraced Yara tightly. My heart beat so hard I thought the whole room shook. I felt a surge of desire I hadn't known I could feel. I lowered my face, closed my eyes, parted my lips, and placed them on Yara's. When our lips parted, I was dizzy and unaware that I was standing. I almost fell to the floor. Yara helped me to a chair. Myrna ran to me and asked in a coaxing tone, Aren't you ashamed? No, Myrna, I'm not ashamed. Myrna squeezed next to me and kissed me, not gently like Yara had, but fiercely, biting my lips and my tongue. Didn't I tell you he was still ours, Yara? she asked. Whose did Yara think I was? I asked her. Gods, moralities, histories, Myrna said. After what you did to her in my clearing, she was convinced you had given your life away, that you had become a servant of the tanks and the firing squads. She wasn't so far wrong, I admitted. Yes, I was, Yara protested. She crowded next to me from the other side and asked, You didn't ever want to turn me into a cadre, did you? I hid my tears by burying my face in Yara's hair. Biting her ear gently, I whispered, No, Yara, I want you exactly as you are. Yasna returned, glanced with surprise at the love scene between the three of us, and turned to Zednik. Poor Zednik, what did you do to drive everyone away from you? Nothing except grow old, Yasna, he told her. Old? All of life is still in front of you, Yasna protested. She sat down on the arm of the chair in Myrna's former position. Is that what you told Krenna? Zednik asked. Yasna almost cried again. She's completely broken. She kept repeating, I'm not like him, Yasna. I'm not like him. I felt so sorry for her. Poor, sad, Vershrika. I tried to tell her none of us thought she was like him at all. She did cause Adrian's and probably Yad's and Yurasnan's jail terms to be lengthened, but she wasn't the one who was responsible for their being in prison to start with. And that rector? Myrna asked. She alone was responsible for that, Yasna admitted, and added, but not a single one of us is pure. Myrna asked, are you boasting, Yasna? You can sometimes be so cruel, Myrna, Yasna told her. God knows what you would have done if, Myrna cut in, if I hadn't concentrated my passion into, into love games, Yara exclaimed, which is what those two didn't ever do, even though they both longed to. They've pinned it all up inside, and it gets so ugly when it's so pent up. I was afraid of her. Didn't you see how she looked at me? I was afraid she'd tear my arms off, one by one, and start eating them. I interrupted Yara to ask Myrna. Yasna started asking you how you knew. About Mr. Zabrin? Yara asked. I knew three years ago, when he had Vesna taken to the hospital. I knew he wasn't having her taken away because he loved her, but because he loved something he called health. I knew even earlier, Myrna said. That day I went to his room, before you were released. He made me feel shame. The same shame I'd felt when my mother found Jan and me sleeping in each other's arms. The same shame I'd felt when she, when she surprised Sabina and me. The same shame I'd felt when Vesna turned rigid the day Yara and I returned from visiting you. I asked, with unintended sarcasm, and from that feeling of shame you inferred. I didn't infer anything, Yarostan, she told me. I felt the same shame the day Yara, Zednik, and I went to his room to invite him to the dance at my plant. The look on his face was the same as my mother's when she saw the devil in me as if I intended to tear his clothes off and pull them into me, right there and then. Hmm. I felt the same shame the day Yara, Zednik, and I went to his room to invite him to the dance at my plant. The look on his face was the same as my mother's when she saw the devil in me, as if I intended to tear his clothes off and pull him into me, right there and then. I nearly melted in the face of that look. Then Zednik told me he had met him at the prisoner's club, that he'd been talking to him when he saw you, and Titus mysteriously vanished. It was only then that I started ask asking myself what Sophia kept asking you. Why hadn't he ever told you about her letter? After Yasna told us what he said to her about Louisa, Yara and I took all of Sophia's letters to Zednik's, and the three of us reread every one of them. Sabina knew who Titus was twenty years ago, and maybe even earlier. Zednik asked Myrna, What I'd like to know is how that business about Krenna got out. Yara told him, 
Oh, I figured all that out by myself. Mr. Zabern had told Yasna everything he knew about Vera, but that really became interesting when I read what Sabina said about her. I went to listen to her lectures. Once I stayed after the lecture and saw Irina, I figured it all out the moment I saw her. She looked exactly the way I'd been supposed to look at the dance. I had Myrna fix me up to look like Sabina again, and I went to see Irina. She acted the, way, the same way I had. We were twins. During all the years she'd worked for Vera, she hadn't figured anything out. Zednik asked, But who started the rumor that supposedly reached Krenna's ears? I'd never heard it before today. Yara blushed and looked guiltily toward Yasna. Oh, that rumor, she said. Yasna wasn't supposed to tell me what she'd learned from Mr. Zabron. I wasn't supposed to tell Julia. Julia's father wasn't supposed to tell the people in the bank where he works, and they weren't supposed to breathe a word to Kren. Everyone laughed, including Yasna. Yara looked relieved. Then Yasna asked Myrna, Where in the world did you learn so much about airplane reservations? I've never even been to the airport. Neither had I, Myrna said. The whole foreign tourist idea was Irina's, or at least originated with her. Irina bought me the clothes and the little purse. I took two trips to the airport in it, and acted as if I wanted to buy a ticket. I had the time of my life there, being ogled by all the important men with briefcases, especially the ones with their wives next to them. They weren't as polite as Comrade Glavny. I also had another reason for going to the airport. At that time, I thought we would soon be taking excursions by airplane. It was Irina who suggested I tell him I was leaving tonight. Otherwise, I never could have made him stay. He kept trying to run out, as it was. Yara asked her, had you planned the mix-up between the airplane and sleeping car tickets? Myrna laughed and told her, Planned it? I was so stupid it didn't occur to me that there wouldn't be a reservation for Mrs. Matthews when he called the airline. That was when I thought my whole game was over. Then I remembered a scene in a movie. A young man rushed to the railway station, pulled out his ticket, and learned it was a bus ticket. Yara asked, What address did you send him to? The only two addresses I knew were Louisa's and Sophia's, and I didn't wish him on either of them, Myrna exclaimed. There were ten of us here, so I wrote, Mrs. Ron Matthews, 10 Damon Street, New York. I hoped he wouldn't happen to know Damon Street didn't exist. Zednik roared with laughter. Maybe it does. Who knows him, whom he'll find. Please forgive me for breaking off so abruptly. Myrna just rushed into the house and told me, They're invading. The tanks are moving toward the city. I can't remember where I stopped, and I don't have the patience to reconstruct my frame of mind. On Monday morning, the day after the celebration, I went to work, and I thought of nothing but Titus Zebron all day long. I was glad to find your letter when I returned from work that, la that afternoon. You confirmed so much of what Myrna and Yara had taught me. I started writing you that night, and I stayed home from work yesterday and today, trying to describe to you every vivid detail, until a few minutes ago, when Myrna returned from a meeting with some friends of hers at her former plant. The tanks are supposed to arrive tomorrow or the next day. I'm continuing an hour later. Yara, Julia, and Irina were just here. Irina had been the first to learn about the coming of the invasion, and Yara had called Myrna at the plant. While they were here, the four of them spoke excitedly about joining a group of people, largely former workers from Myrna's plant, who were constituting themselves into a sort of reception committee for the tanks. They intend to remove as many street signs as possible and to knock on doors and suggest that people remove the numbers from their houses. Irina is no longer Vera Krenna's secretary. The day after tomorrow, that job might cease to exist anyway. All four of them begged me to join them, but, as, but I decided to stay to try to finish this letter. Tomorrow, I may not be able to mail it. I'm alone again, but I'm finding it impossible to concentrate on anything except the tanks and the fact that Mr. Nanovo is in front of his house racing, raking leaves. He had disappeared for several months. The past two mornings, I got up before sunrise to continue this letter, and I heard Nanovo returning from the bar where he works. According to official accounts, an army of four million men is massed at our frontiers. Four million! In some circles they've described it as barbarian hordes, but I'm sure the vast majority of them are workers, exactly like the people they're coming to repress. They're not barbarians, but the project they're about to realize is one of the most barbaric acts in history. Such an invading force could annihilate a population ten times larger than ours in a single day. How did so many centuries of progress lead to the scandalous barbarism? What kind of system can afford to support a permanent force of four million trained assassins? Can you even imagine how much of a society's activity has to be concentrated on war-related work to supply an army of four million, in quote, peacetime? In the name of the most total liberation of human beings proclaimed by any historical period, human beings are subjugated by the most barbaric brute violence. It would be more comforting to think the invaders were creatures from another planet or insects. What is so terrifying is the thought that the invaders are workers like ourselves, 
workers who may next week be repressed by armies consisting of the very workers they are repressing now. It isn't they, the enemy, who are driving those tanks and carrying those rifles. It's we, we comrades, fellow workers, brothers, who failed to communicate with each other, who failed to destroy the tanks and the plants that produce them and the laboratories that design them. We who failed to destroy the schools where we're taught to produce tanks, the schools where we're taught to obey the commanders who order us to assassinate each other. Worker will be killing worker. Like will be repressing like, as at the time of the repression of the Magarna Rising. I had thought our letters were a step toward communication across these frontiers, at least a symbolic step. But the frontiers haven't fallen. To the workers in the tanks were a population, quote, out of control. We're as incomprehensible as insects. We're like creatures from another planet. And in some ways we are. We had started to be free human beings. Zednik was just here. He came directly from his job, and he alarmed me considerably. He learned that a section of the political police is back in operation, patrolling the streets for, quote, vandals and terrorists. I'm extremely worried. Supper time has come and gone, and there's no sign of Myrna and Yara. I don't doubt the ability or resourcefulness of either of them. They've amply demonstrated these qualities to me during recent weeks. But they're extremely vulnerable. Yara's, quote, combat experience is limited to a few protest demonstrations at her primary school, and Myrna spent most of the past two decades in a clothing factory. The political police, on the other hand, have 20 years of experience in, quote, defining social diseases and in, quote, isolating dangerous individuals before they, quote, infect the class. Zednik was furious when I told him where they had gone. You don't play cat and mouse with a machine gun, he shouted. I lost my temper and quoted Zednik's own statement. Why repress yourself? Because they might repress you. Let them do the repressing. Zednik said, that's inappropriate now. He went out to look for them, determined to bring back the reckless idiots. I'm worried because I know that none of them will return home at the first sign of danger. They're all convinced they have a world to win and nothing to lose but a condition of lifeless routine to which none of them can acquiesce now. The extreme caution and fear of trouble that had characterized Myrna's behavior after Jan's and my arrest, and even after Yara's first demonstration, disappeared without leaving a trace when Myrna's fellow workers in the clothing factory disbanded as a production group and became explorers of a new world. At this morning's meeting, as soon as Myrna and her friends learned about the coming invasion, they unanimously decided that the moment the invasion took place, they would see to it that the machinery at their plant would never again be used to produce clothing for a regime like the one they experienced for 20 years. After that act, they would disband until the possibility for further communication and exploration existed again. Some of them are preparing to emigrate. Others are determined to, quote, stop the tanks. Myrna is among the latter. When she returned this afternoon, Myrna told me, I no longer have any reason to spend my life behind machinery. My mother and Vesna are both dead. You're on your own. Yara is old enough to take care of herself, and if she's not, Zednik, as well as Yasna, will surely be cautious enough to remain out of prison and to be able to help her. Certainly Zednik will. Old as he is, he loves sheer survival more than any of the rest of us. Between Myrna's and Zednik's present attitudes, I know I'll choose Myrna's idiotic recklessness. The only time I sought survival within the confines of the police capitalism about to be imposed was immediately after Myrna and I were married. It was then that Titus helped me find three jobs. That period ended with the Magarna Rising. After my release eight years later, the thought of suicide appealed to me more than the thought of resuming that kind of life. Yara's, quote, recklessness brought me, as well as Myrna, back to life. Yara's demonstration for her fire teacher showed me that the possibility of rebellion has not been suppressed, and it has also revived Myrna's desires. Myrna embraced both Yara and me, she was as excited by the evidence of devilry in Yara as by the friendship that formed between Yara and me on that day. For me, the impossible re rebellion, for Myrna, the impossible passion, had become possible again. Myrna wanted me for herself, as her brother. She wanted me even more for Yara. But her passion for vicarious incest remained quiet, buried far below the surface, and when the police official came to our house because Nanovo had reported me as the instigator of Yara's demonstration... Myrna reverted to silence. Unable to trust me unreservedly and afraid of Myrna's moods, Yara sought her allies elsewhere, with her school friends Julia and Slobodan. It was with them she played her first love games in the attic of Julia's house. The games were based mainly on gossip they learned from the popular press, 
apparently their favorite game, was about the boss of Julia's father, bank director Kren. Yara told me Slobodan played Kren. Yara played Vera, and Julia played the unknown lover. Some time after Nanovo reported me to the police, the three of them, together with a university friend of Julia's, placed two large snakes in Nanovo's house. That was why he had disappeared. Yara wasn't the only one who discovered allies after that first demonstration. I discovered my first ally in Yara, and this led me to seek others. I became curious about Louisa, and about you and Sabina. Myrna remembered your address. I also learned that the carton plant was in the process of change. I found the same spirit there I had found in Yara after her demonstration. An epoch seemed to have ended. It now seems that we've had only a brief vacation, but I can no longer go back to, quote, work. Ever since Jan and I were arrested at the steel plant 12 years ago, I've acquiesced to the requirements of the social order only under compulsion, namely in prison. I know I will not return to the carton plant tomorrow or next week and submit to the orders of police-appointed managers, union bureaucrats, or foremen. Instinctive rebellion, Titus called it. He's right. I don't have the instincts of ants or bees. I can't function in a hive. My instincts are similar to Jan's and Manuel's instincts, and I finally know that. I finally know it's not the productive forces that are fettered, but the human beings. By continuing to reproduce them, we're depriving ourselves of the possibility to develop. We're expropriating ourselves of our human qualities. We're becoming tanks. Zednik seems to feel that by submitting to the repressive routine, we can at least survive. Then our potentialities can reemerge when another opportunity arises. I don't know if I ever agreed with such an outlook. I certainly don't now. With that outlook, one could justify returning to any job, even the job of driving a tank or carrying a rifle for an invading army. In the act of keeping myself alive for the next chance, I would destroy those who are grasping for life right now. I see no reason to collaborate with the ruling order at any time, under any circumstances. There are tanks in the street. I didn't get this letter in the mail yesterday. Yasna came late last night. She was almost hysterical. I hadn't seen her since the celebration. I've hardly slept since then, she told me. I'm still attached to him, Yarastan. I can't help it. I had known many of those things before, and I hadn't turned against him because of them. And even if I hadn't known any of it, I just can't wipe out a lifelong friendship in a few hours. I've admired him for 25 years. I wanted so much to provide him with comradeship, to end his isolation. Whatever he did in the past, I know he was sincere in wanting comrades today, and I know he's unambiguously opposed to the coming invasion. He was always sympathetic to the most radical workers. Provided they carried out the correct historical project, I reminded her. Even that might have changed, she insisted. I've been thinking about nothing else day and night. This afternoon, as soon as I heard about the invasion, I went to the trade union building. I wanted to tell him I was still his friend, but he wasn't in. A secretary told me this was his first absence in years. I went to his room. I love him, Yarastan. Everything that's come out hasn't destroyed my love. I listened at his door but heard nothing. I asked the building guard and his neighbors if they had seen him, and none of them had. I waited at his door until now. I can't tell you what I fear. He was, after all, a human being and not a dog. Yasna and I rushed to Titus's apartment building. It was past midnight. The front entrance was closed. We rang the building guard's bell. Yasna told him she had left her purse with her identification card inside, in Titus's room. We told him Titus had mysteriously vanished and asked him to accompany us to Titus's room for the purse. He recognized Yasna and gave us the key to the room, excusing himself for not accompanying us. He was in his bedclothes. Titus Sabrin was dead. He had shot himself through the head. There were no explanatory papers or notes in his modest room. I had never seen his room before. It's true that he derived no personal benefit from the political commitment to the proletariat's health, within the limits of presently available knowledge, like Vesna's doctors. There was a bed, a table, a bookshelf, and a record player that was still turning. He had apparently been listening to Don Giovanni, an opera by Mozart. In the bookshelf, I recognized the two books he had lent me when he'd visited me in prison, The Brothers Karamazov and The Castle. The walls of the room were bare. Yasna collapsed in my arms. I left the record player turning, closed Titus's door quietly, supported Yasna to the, bu to the building entrance, and slipped the key under the building guard's door. Yasna revived in the fresh air as we walked to the taxi stand by the Trade Union Council building. She told me she wasn't able to return to her house alone. I asked the driver to take us to my house. Yasna and I spent the night together. 
She's waiting for me now. There's been no sign of Myrna or Yara or Irina or Julia. Zednik hasn't come again. We're going to try and find them and join them. Yasna isn't crying this morning. The despair comes from the thought that the tanks cannot be superseded. Yasna is smiling, beautiful, and brave. I've been on the side of repression and death, including Vesna's, for too long. If the joyless drudgery is reimposed, I will not be among those who reproduce it. I doubt that this letter will reach you. I can no longer drop it in a mailbox. If it does reach you, please accept my apology for attitudes which reflected 20 years of ignorance. Yasna sends her love to all of you. So do I. Yarostan.